Well, the title says it all, but it's not what I'm necessarily saying. It's what Dr. Lane Norton says in a recent video on collagen for skin. It's especially confusing when we also have voices like Dr. Brad Stanfield saying the opposite. Collagen still gets the green light for him. Although, they're talking about the same new analysis that condemns collagen supplementation. So, I have a lot of work ahead of me to clear up some of the confusion. Let's listen in on Dr. Norton's points, and then I'd like to go a layer deeper. Collagen supplementation looks like it's a scam. If you're taking collagen that melts your glass, I have to agree, don't consume that collagen. It is a scam. Ah, the joys of AI image generation. One thing I've been very consistent with is I am very skeptical of collagen supplementation for the following reason. You trying to improve your connective tissue or your collagen, if you eat collagen, if you ingest a supplement, that supplement gets broken down during digestion to the constitutive amino acids. It's not like you take in collagen and it just goes right into your connective tissue. That's not how it works. It gets broken down mostly into single amino acids. Okay, let me stop there because this has been debunked. In fact, even Dr. Norton has pointed this out in research and past videos. What happens is that collagen is hydrolyzed and broken down into its constitutive amino acids because as that collagen protein, because it is a protein and like any protein, as it enters the stomach, you have high concentrations of hydrochloric acid, which is gonna cause that three-dimensional structure of that protein to begin to unfold, it's called denaturation. Then you have pepsin and pepsinogen, which are going to begin chopping those polypeptide sequences up. Then when it hits the duodenum of the small intestine, you have proteases like trypsin, chymotrypsin, that are going to come in and chop it up into basically like one, two, and three amino acid sequences. That Those are what gets absorbed into circulation, and that is what your cells, your periphery, end up seeing. So he's exactly right here. Collagen gets broken down into single amino acids, but critically also as di and tripeptides, like shown in this study, where we see the dipeptide proline and glycine in the blood of humans. That's important because the argument isn't that cells that produce collagen are taking up the building blocks of collagen, like glycine independently, proline independently, and so on, but that these peptides, the two and three amino acids still bound together, are bioactive. That means that the collagen peptides bind to receptors on the cells or get taken up inside the cells and change the cell signaling. Not necessarily that they get used to form collagen themselves, although that's certainly another mechanism. In mechanistic studies, when scientists apply collagen peptides to skin cells, they react by producing more of the structural proteins. Now, these studies aren't perfect, but they do speak to the bioactive ability of collagen peptides, and there are plenty of other studies that indicate the same. So the main point here is that yes, collagen peptides contain the molecules necessary to produce mature collagen in the body, but that's not the main reason it's argued that we should consume them. Rather, the collagen peptides themselves that we do absorb are bioactive, convincing the cells to produce more co mature collagen. That was a lot. Let's continue. So if it's not increasing connective tissue synthesis rates, then how is this improvement happening for people? Because we do have human randomized controlled trials demonstrating that collagen supplementation can improve pain, recovery outcomes, that it can improve skin elasticity, skin hydration, reduce the risk of wrinkles. Why is there a divergence in this research literature? Well, a new meta-analysis just got published looking at the effect of collagen supplementation on skin elasticity, skin hydration, and wrinkles. And the overall take home from this meta-analysis was that collagen supplementation improves skin elasticity, skin hydration, and decreases the incidence of wrinkles. So that means I'm wrong about collagen supplementation, right? Hold up, hey, hey. So this is the meat, or if you want, the lentil of the topic. This new analysis, it says collagen supplements work at improving skin against his argument, but Dr. Norton is about to shut that down. Just reading from the discussion of the paper. However, in the sensitivity analysis, now a sensitivity analysis is where they remove each individual study one at a time and see if they redo the meta-analysis if the results still hold. And it's meant to protect against a single study having too much influence on the overall meta-analysis. So 
Again, I read, in the sensitivity analysis, excluding outlier studies showing an extreme beneficial effect, collagen supplements showed no significant improvement of wrinkles and a decreased effect for skin hydration and elasticity. So basically, if you look through this meta-analysis, there was one study that showed like this huge benefit. And when they took that out, it either nullified the results or drastically decreased them. I won't explain that further. Dr. Norton does a great job. However, I think that it's important to look at that data. This is skin elasticity, and it provides an excellent example of Dr. Norton's point. In short, if the studies move to the right of the vertical line there, there's an improvement in skin elasticity. Notice that one Jaka study. Let's, let's just pronounce, pretend like, just insert that I said that study name correctly. It's way out there. They might have been talking about skin cocaine, not peptides, but regardless, it has significant influence on the total result, which is displayed in this diamond down here. So the researchers do, to Lane's point, a sensitivity analysis and remove that study, and clearly the diamond moves closer to the line, indicating a reduced effect. I do have to point out, though, that even when we remove these outlier studies, there's still an effect in two out of the three skin measures. But Dr. Norton comes in with an even better argument. In fact, this next argument was so good, it made me reconsider my stance on collagen. But more importantly, they did what's called a subgroup analysis, where they add an extra differentiator in the inclusion criteria, and they separate out these different studies and look to see if the results still hold. Their differentiator was funding source. So they separated out studies funded by companies that sell collagen skin products versus studies that were not funded by companies that sell collagen skin products. And what did they find? I read direct from the paper. More importantly, in the subgroup meta-analysis by funding source, Studies that did not receive funding from pharmaceutical companies showed no significant effect of collagen supplements for improving skin hydration, elasticity, and wrinkles, while those funded showed significant improvements in all categories. Then they did one more subgroup analysis. They did it based on methodological quality. I will read again from the conclusion. High quality studies revealed no significant effect of collagen supplements for improving skin hydration, elasticity, and wrinkles, while low quality studies did show their beneficial effects for improving skin elasticity. I do say all the time, hey guys, if your only criticism of study is the funding source that says more about your bias than the researchers, and I stand by that if your only criticism is of that. But those studies also, in this meta-analysis, were of lower methodological quality. Okay, the bottom line is that the initial conclusion of the analysis that collagen supplementation improves the skin was completely driven by studies that were funded by industry studies, like skin company funded studies. I agree with Dr. Norton on a few things here. One, I too do not throw away studies merely because they're funded by industry. However, when we do have independent studies not funded by industry and they show a different result, I will side with those studies over the industry studies. And as Lane explained quite well, that's exactly what happens here. When you group just the non-industry funded studies together, collagen supplementation suddenly shows no effect. That's quite a bombshell and it's a wonderful argument backed by data. So in this case, I agree we should downgrade the industry studies. So it was at this point in the video that I thought I should begin prepping my video saying that I've changed my stance on collagen supplements. But of course, I had to look at the analysis for myself. And when I did, I laughed. Here's why. There are seven studies that the researchers identified as being not industry funded. So independent funding. So I decided to open up all these studies individually it didn't take long for me to notice a striking trend. In fact, I didn't even need to open the studies because even the authors of the meta-analysis that we've been going over describe it in their own analysis. But for impact, let me put all seven independent studies on the screen now. And I'd like you to take a guess as to how many of these studies found collagen supplements did not improve skin. In fact, I'm going to color them green 
if they found an effect, which we'd expect few to see an effect, if any, and I'll color them red if they did not find an effect. Okay, have your guess in mind. On the count of three. One, two, three. That's right. You aren't misunderstanding, although you might be a bit confused. And if you're colorblind, then you're also annoyed. The point here is that only one out of seven of the independent studies showed no effect. Said differently, six out of seven of the studies found an effect of collagen supplementation. How about that for a bombshell? In fact, it's a similar point brought up by Dr. Stanfield in his video on the topic where he discusses the high quality studies as opposed to the independent studies that we just went over. The meta-analysis uses two different common measures of study quality, and there were nine studies in total that got the highest marks for both of those measures. And we just saw that when the authors looked at just those nine studies, they concluded that there was no benefit overall from collagen peptide supplements. So you might expect that none or at most one or two of those individual studies may have found benefits. But here's the surprise. So of those nine studies, only one found no benefit. Another one found mixed results, but the other seven all showed positive impacts from collagen peptide supplements on aspects of skin aging. So the point being, the vast majority of the independent non-industry funded studies as defined by the analysis researchers showed a benefit of collagen supplementation. Now, of course, this raises a defining question. What's with the all collagen naysaying then? Why did the researchers conclude that the independent studies did not show an effect of the collagen supplementation? Well, there are multiple reasons actually. I won't be able to go over all of them in this video because I try to keep these shorter considering the amount of feedback I get to keep things shorter. And we both know that this video is already going to be long and focused on statistics. If you're interested in more explanation of all the statistics and how collagen works, check out my research platform, The Physiotic Insiders. It's the way that I get to keep doing this kind of work for you. It's also filled with benefits like having weekly videos, articles, a private podcast, live sessions with me and the community, and much more. If you're looking for an extra layer and more applicable information, you'll find it all in there. The link to join is in the description. Let's discuss a bit on why though. There are multiple reasons, but one is that when you start out with 23 studies at the beginning of the analysis, and then you start segmenting them based on different subgroup criteria, you reduce the number of studies available to find an effect. In this case, we divide the studies by independence of funding and quality of study design. Beyond that, not all the studies looked at the three main skin metrics, skin elasticity, hydration, and wrinkling. So, that further reduces the number of studies. In some instances, the analysis went from 24 studies down to one, two, or three studies. Since the amount of available data is constrained by the criteria placed on it, the confidence in the result weakens to such a degree that statistically speaking, the result is no effect, even if there might be an effect. Beyond that, in the high quality study subgroup analysis, the researchers do identify an effect. And guess what? those sub-analyses tend to have more studies, i.e. more data included, in the neighborhood of like 11 or 12 studies, which correlates with my point. Like I said, there's more to say, like some errors that I caught in the analysis, but I don't want to lose half the audience. So I'll leave the rest for my extended edition if you're interested. None of this changes the overall point, which is this analysis is not as foolproof as we thought. There's still huge opportunity for collagen supplements to work. However, I want to address two more excellent critiques. One of them has been brought up by Dr. Norton before, and that is that there are no collagen skin studies that compare against protein all the studies comparing against a placebo. But if people are trying to figure out if there's a unique effect of collagen as opposed to simply eating more protein or eating more glycine, proline, et cetera, then we need randomized controlled trials comparing them. Unfortunately, we don't have any. Dr. Stanfield brings up a particular study that compared against protein for skin healing from burns that indicates benefit of collagen, but I would like to see more evidence. So I agree with Dr. Norton that we need better studies and we need studies comparing against protein and proteins rich in amino acids that make up collagen. A second critique that I would foresee coming is that even with a few studies, we should 
be able to show benefits. I think this critique can be a good one, assuming that we're expecting collagen peptides to turn Al Pacino now back into Al Pacino from Scarface. Okay, maybe I, maybe I should pick a different movie. We'll go with The Godfather. You can choose whichever one you want. I don't think that most reasonable people in the collagen space are saying that collagen peptides are going to be life-changing. I could be wrong, but this isn't my stance at least. Collagen peptides seem to help the skin and reverse signs of aging, but they aren't going to turn the back the clock 40 years or anything. So in that context, I would fully expect a need for more quality data to detect small to moderate effects. That's a speculation on my end though. In the end, what's the bottom line here? Well, I agree with Dr. Norton on certain aspects, the protein comparison, for example, but I'm still leaning, although not strongly, in favor of collagen supplements being a benefit for the old facials. I don't think that once you look a layer deeper at this analysis that you get a convincing argument against collagen, but that doesn't mean that we don't need better research. If you're interested in a deeper dive on collagen for the face or for the joints, check them out right here and here, and thanks for tuning in. I'll catch you next time.